Good morning, everyone from Atlanta, Georgia, USA. Welcome to this month's episode of Action Items. I am your host, DC Spregula. We are on the Let's Talk Supply Chain platform, and I am excited to have you here with me today. Welcome back if this is not your first time. Welcome to my world if this is your first time. As always, our sponsor is Nugent Architects. And Nugent Architects is a digital transformation consultant agency helping businesses navigate the complex world of technology and digital supply chain. The NGA team of supply chain experts and solution architects works with clients in all phases of the implementation lifecycle from initial planning to post-implementation support, including tool selection, project and program management, and business transformation road mapping, and reskilling and upskilling your workforce. To learn how NGA can support your business scale and implement digital, visit NugentArchitects.com for more information and to schedule a discovery session with a member of our team. So it is October. It is busy. Happy Friday, Rob. You are always here with us. <laughs> um, so welcome back. Thank you for always sticking around and uh, contributing to the conversation. October, November are heavy, heavy conference months. It's a great time to be discussing innovation um, within supply chain, across industries, across company size. Uh, I personally this week here in Atlanta attended the, attended the Greener Manufacturing Conference, and it was great um, to see all of the different products you know, made with renewable materials made with compostable materials, bioplastics, um, really talking about also day two, digital AI and predictive analytics, and how that can be used for sustainability, closed loop manufacturing, um, raw material planning, reduction in production and not overproducing, lots of great conversations. Um, it was the second year, as I understand, here in North America. It's been going on in Europe. I highly encourage um, anyone who is interested in sustainability within the supply chain um, and alternative uh, materials for plastics to uh, attend next year, uh, the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance. Uh, shout out to them for really putting together a great event. Uh, so coming up on the NGA docket and on my personal travel schedule, so if you will be there, definitely drop me a line. The end of the month, October 29th through 31st, I will be in Washington, D.C. speaking at the CMAA annual conference about digital supply chain fundamentals for the construction industry. If you attend my session, you also get continuing education credits, so that is always a plus. And of course, I'm fun. It's going to be very interesting. Um, I'll be giving a very similar talk here in Atlanta at the Allsite Construction Expo in November. Um, so if you can't catch me in D.C. and you happen to be local, um, then you can definitely catch me there. And you can register at um, Allsite Construction. I think it's Allsite Construction Expo uh, .com. Nicole, if you'll drop the link in case anyone is interested in checking that out. Um, then we will see you there. So without further ado, I will bring up my guest for this month. And this has been a long time coming. I'm very, very excited about it. Um, we have Klaus. Looks like we we lost Michael. Um, so his loss. <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh, no, yeah. There he is. There he right is. Right in time. Speaking <laughs> of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the devil. Both of you guys joining from Europe. So um, afternoon for you guys. Um, let's go ahead and get started. So um, tell us a little bit uh, for anyone who doesn't know who you are. I guess it's in my mind, it's like who needs an introduction to these guys. But for anyone who doesn't know who you guys are, um, give a quick introduction. And then I would really like to understand. I mean, here we're here to talk about this book, Tribal F's Up Digital. Um, we're going to be talking about I, I may or may not read all of these quotes that I have highlighted <laughs> in my sticky notes. Um, but I mean, we're talking about tribal processes and workflows and how that sabotages digital. We're also going to talk about a couple of studies. Um, why have you guys dedicated so much of your life's work, really? I mean, writing a book is not easy. Your life's work to really championing this cause and, and writing the book. Um, and tell us a little bit about your background. Why don't you um, start, Klaus? 
Yeah, thanks for having us today, DC. Uh, really, really great pl pleasure to be here. Um, I'm almost 40 years in business, uh, almost 30 years in supply chain, doing a lot of transformational stuff over the years. Um, lived through many um, uh, waves and hypes. Um, and currently undergoing the Jet GPT, AI, ML, whatsoever technology hype again. Um, what triggered me to uh, to write the book is that there's so much around uh, on investments in, in 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 technology, yet I think um, it does not always uh, yield the results that that are expected. And there are um, um, I think a couple of more or less very very simple reasons for this. And um, it was a kind of um, um, uh, uh, important thing to me to bring this up and to to phrase my opinion, my viewpoint. And um, uh, in Michael, I found a great, great co-author. Um, I think we are very like-minded in the way how we see the world and in the ex experience that we have in various transformations. Um, so um, it was it was a great pleasure. It was a, a lot of work, but a great pleasure as well. What about you, Michael? Yeah, sure. I'm Michael Chatos. I read the Supply Chain Service Line as its CEO, uh, Jen Pack. And, um, DC, obviously, we, we, we worked together at Buck Holly, which was the company that, uh, that we sold to Genpak. So we built a company out of six people in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, on the premise of helping companies actually realize true business transformation with advanced planning tools. Um, and that was a point of differentiation you know, for over a decade. And I, I think that when Klaus reached out to me and talked to me about this project, um, it hit home because there's so many companies today that call us up and say, Hey, my team's just not any good. They're not adopting the tools. Can you give me 200 planners? Or, hey, can I outsource planning as a service? I know you um, at Next Gen Architects as well have started to provide supplemental resourcing. I feel like so many of the failure points start before you even start the project. Um, and at the end of the day, like executives end up blaming the software companies, the technology didn't do what they promised. I mean, of course, software companies are going to oversell in the sales cycle. Um, you know, what they say like, hey, my team, no, my, my team, my team, yeah, yeah. Yeah. my team, my team, came, like I oversold my fiance that I was only gonna do one work call today. It's my third work call, right? Uh, but, uh, but, um, yeah, and I apologize. Obviously, I'm on vacation in, in Italy, but, uh, I just feel like there's so many excuses after projects fail, you know, and in 2015, Forbes did a study where 65% of projects were essentially failures. Um, CFO Magazine did a study where 86% didn't hit the projected ROI. And everybody then goes back and says, the software oversold, my team didn't know what they were doing. Uh, but so many decisions and so many mistakes can be avoided up front. And I felt like to not share and communicate that message was doing a disservice um, to the entire industry, especially as you're looking at an industry that, you know, semiconductor alone to be short a million people by 2030 from a, a resourcing headcount. So as things like generative AI, machine learning, AI, advanced planning technologies, control tower solutions come to bear, if companies don't have the ability to effectively implement those and change their ways of working to drive greater automation and more of exception-based process management, there's simply just not gonna be the talent in the market to be able to provide the, the drugs, the brands, the chips, the you name the uh, item that our lives depend upon. So I think sharing that message was important. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, it's, I have, it, oh, go ahead, Klaus. <laughs> and it's being in the consulting business is also a differentiator because um, there are, of course, many consultants around. Um, and my strong impression is that not all of them really care about the, the sustainable success of a transformation, the effectiveness of a transformation. But I think this is what counts. I'm CEO. Of a, of a consulting company as, as you both are as well, um, MSV Solutions. And for us, it's imperative to guide the customer to success, to effectiveness of digital investments and digital transformation. And in this sense, the book is also a kind of differentiator to others because it really calls out what's important for us and what we think is important for the, for the client. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it, there are a couple of things that I've written down here, um, but one of the things just kind of recency effect going off of what you just said, Klaus, is that there are a lot of consultants. Um, and uh, from my experience and not 
from, you know, this is what I think, but having been told even by other supply chain consultants, you know, partners, colleagues, people we work with, they don't get this a lot from a digital perspective. A lot, there are a lot of really smart consultants, a lot of, you know, really smart experts that get the general best practices of supply chain how to move goods, how to work with your, you know, suppliers, the very different, you know, the different supply chain functions, but then digitalizing that, putting that mm -hmm. into technology, as Michael mentioned, the AI, the, the advanced planning tools, all of that. Many people come to me and say, I need you for that part of it. <laughs> so <laughs> I that this is a, this is a really? great book for practitioners and people leading but also for our peers, you know, within the, the consulting space. Absolutely. But you made an important point. It's, 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 just a, it's probably just a detail. You said putting a process into technology. Many companies approach it exactly the different, the other way around, um, throwing technology at, at processes and, 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 and hoping and expecting that the process is going to improve. This is not the case. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really, this is already a difference in how you, how you approach it. Yeah? And I didn't and even many... think about it. It's become second nature for me because, <laughs> because my, Michael says that we worked <laughs> together at Barkawi, but I really worked for him. I didn't know anything. You know, all of this stuff that he just said, when I started, I had no idea what all of those words meant. So now <laughs> listening and being able to be involved in the conversation, I mean, if anything, Michael, you can say, okay. I actually taught somebody something in my life. <laughs> there we go. Well, um, that, you're, so, you're a great so uh, people it, to you have. Know, it's second nature for me. I didn't think about it from that perspective, but I can absolutely remember, you know, after my time at Barcalvin going to another company, you know, I was hands on keyboards at Anaplan, you know, configuring Anaplan. And I very specifically remember like, hey, here are our spreadsheets. Put this into the tool. And then I'm like, but these don't tie out in Excel. Why would they tie out? in the tool, but I seemed to be the only person that was thinking about it. I was like, this doesn't, chicken or the egg, that's not a debate. This is you putting the cart before the horse. You know, how do we, how yeah. do we go back? Um, but can you, Nicole, very quickly, the, um, the PWC study, and this is from 2023, because um, Michael mentioned 2015 studies. I mean, like very, um, what? 83% of executives yeah. say the technology investment didn't fully deliver expected results. That's higher than 65. I mean, that's higher than what I've seen in the last studies in the last couple of years. Um, and most recently, I remember 70. So we went from 65% into the 70s. We're now into 83% of companies not realizing the expected results. I mean, what is like it's getting worse. What is yeah. what is the cause of that? It's not getting better despite despite us three sitting here telling everyone <laughs> what this well, uh, I I'm, okay. so I, I would say there's a couple things. So one, obviously the hype and the expectations of what digitalization should bring are a lot different than it was in 2015. I mean, if you look back in 2015 in supply chain in particular a lot of the expectation was baseline on what people did in APO and ASCP, um, which was very much of an aggregation source of data and planning offline. Um, so I think one, expectations are significantly higher. Two, technology solutions have become way more expensive. I mean, like, let's just, I mean, look at some of the leading tools in supply chain, you know, their monthly cost is 10x what it was a decade ago. So all of a sudden, the business case you need to drive is significantly larger, right? So not only do you have capability expectations, but your business expectations have materially increased. Uh, number three, the value in a lot of these tools and technologies is the ability to uh, execute and realize a completely new operating model, whether that's collapsing the organizational structure and moving to things like concurrent planning, connecting planning and execution, um, but it forces change management, and this is something Klaus and I speak to uh, at the book level, it forces change management not just across hard and soft skills of the individual planner, but it forces change management that crosses functional silos and, and actually like fiefdoms inside of most organizations. Because you're trying to move from a functional optimization solution to an enterprise orchestration tool. Uh, and that requires a different degree of change management from the executive level 
uh, all the way down to the executional metrics and performance, um, you know, incentive plans that you should be putting in place. So I think, you know, those three things uh, add to the complexity. Then you have the overall impact of the market. So, you know, five, 10 years ago, it was supply chain boutique consulting firms that did this work. Now it's every major SI. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of those SIs are really good at managing EOP systems. They don't know anything when it comes to trying to truly drive a transformation in supply chain. But they instantaneously get a lot of this work because they're running the S4 program or they're running the EOP maintenance for SAP. So you have a lot of providers in the space that are truly not supply chain practitioners that are more of mechanics that say, okay, you want a square wheel? I can go configure a square wheel. No one's asking why that makes sense or should they even be asking for that requirement, right? So to your comment about replicate what I have in Excel today in Anaplan. Um, and I think then the other challenge you have is the proliferation of, of, um, of software publishers in the space. You know, so you go back 10 years, it was the two key EOP players and there was five or six software companies and we all know their names. Uh, you look at a Magic Quadrant say there's like 40, 50 players. Um, you go to their websites, they all sound the same. Thanks. They all use the same marketing material. They all use the same sales pitch. They've all gotten smart enough now at this point to figure out how to make a demo be the best version of the tool that you will ever see or ever think exists. Um, so the, challenge, the challenging decision-making has become materially harder. So again, a lot of those comments lean towards things that companies need to be doing before the project starts to be successful. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the effort before the project starts is a procurement exercise. And that doesn't align to what needs to be put into place to be successful for an operational transformation. Absolutely. Klaus, do you have anything to add? Absolutely. Building I feel like we're on a conference stage and I'm moderating yeah. the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Building on your topic, and uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, Michael, on the system integrators. It starts with a name, right? System integrators. They are not uh, operating model modelers um, um, and consultants in this sense, but system integrators. So if it's just a system integration um, to an existing or, or just, uh, let's say, um, uh, fine-tuned process, it's, of course, not a transformational um, um, ambition that you're going for. So one of the key questions is, is it a real, true transformation that a company is approaching? Um, or is it just a renovation of an as-is process that is called a transformation? And this is a big difference. Um, and I think that a transformation really needs much more, as Michael said, than just the implementation of a system, right? Because this is not, not really moving the needle. This is not really making the drastic change. The enablement that, that digital digitalization, that digital tools have need to be converted into ideas of new operating models um, and new organizational structures in order to be really transformative. But this is a lot of pre-work before you even start with just implementing a tool. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have it was, a... It, that, Go ahead. DC, if I could jump in real quick, it was interesting. I literally just got off a call. So this was one of my two vacation calls this morning. Yeah, I was going to say, aren't you on vacation? I am, <laughs> I am technically, yes. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'm like right outside of Pisa, actually. So, uh, but, uh, but it was it was funny in the call within an hour. I got asked two two questions. First question was, do we think it's okay that we release an RFP to the SIs before we pick the technology? And my immediate question was like, okay, if we don't even know what tool we're looking at, how do you know if any of the SIs actually have capabilities and credentials in the tool? And if we don't know the technology, we don't even know the bounds of the operating model. So like if you're picking a technology that's running in batch, we're not talking about changing the organization from functional planning to time horizon based network planning. That's a massive change. Some companies have done it. Some companies have it. How do we not even know that requirement, but we're picking the SI, right? It doesn't make any sense. And then the second question I got was, do you think it's okay if we pick the tool before we have them demo anything with our data? Because it's going to take too long to get our data into solution. And I was like, well, if you want to see all tools look exactly perfect, sure. But how are you going to assess if the tool can actually truly enable some of the capabilities of your next-gen operating model if you haven't actually forced them to show it in the technology? Some of these tools will take the data and ingest it and show it in three weeks because it's core product. Other tools, you're going to be doing development during the project. So even like from that standpoint, the, the, what you need from a transformation partner in an um, off-the-shelf solution in which you're parameterizing uh, uh, variables 
Plus, what you need in a project that is technically a development of software during the deployment is completely different. Um, but the decision-making process from a procurement standpoint is simply, we don't have time to do that. We need to run all three in parallel. So I'm not going to say that project's going to fail, but it's not set up in a great spot to start with. And that's what, so we have, uh, we have like 20 minutes left and I'm, I'm looking at the comments coming in and I'm looking at the questions and I'm thinking about my questions and I'm like, this is, a bad this is <laughs> like, this was, this was not defined. The scope was not defined enough to go through. Because I, I mean, we can go into this forever and ever and ever, but that's the time aspect um, is something that I want to talk to because yesterday I spoke with um, Bobby Ziner over at Advanced Biotechnologies, and um, he talked about he was talking about their you know advanced planning AI IoT you know all of this different stuff that they were doing um, at their organization from the manufacturing plant. And I just quite frankly asked him. I, I don't know if anyone else knows what you just talked about, the scale of what you just told us, but why did you take that on in a world where most of these technologies, as we see, are not providing the value? Um, and it's just a really big lift. And he told me it's been six and a half years. It's been six and a half years and they're not, I mean, I know the scale and the size of companies that you guys work with. They start at 40 million, they're at 200 million now in revenue. So we're not talking about a huge yeah. multinational. It's been six and a half years. Yeah. So he said, you know, I did it at GE. I know it can be done. So I just did it the right way under the expectation that you have to make time if it's going to actually provide the value. And he attributes their technology and the implementation to their growth from, you know, 40 million to 200 million in such a short amount of time. But I mean, six and a half years, I don't, I don't know very many people. I don't want to say any because that's a very absolute statement, but I don't know very many people who are like, yeah, the board's going to go for that. You know, six, yeah. six years from now, we'll this see the benefit. And yeah. This is why it's so important to also influence the sea level. And this is definitely part of the target group that we are approaching with the book because um, the sea level is told by software vendors, hey, it's just a piece of cake, take our software and it's done and dusted. 10 and weeks, we you're up and running. You um, see value yeah, yeah, yeah. Thir 13 all weeks, this, I got you. All <laughs> this, all <laughs> this, all this, sorry, but all this bullshit, all this bullshit, it takes longer. Than expected, it's much much more um, expensive um, than than the sea level might want to. Um, it needs much more involvement of them, but approving a budget and, and and kicking off a project, it's much much more because you need to touch the organization. You need to go into the dimensions that that are determining the the, the company structure today. If you want to turn from a from a functional model into an end to end model, all these things, and it needs a different level of involvement and a very different understanding from the very beginning, um, um, specifically on the C level, because disappointment starts with expectation. Um, the, the all these studies do not say that X percent, seventy, eighty three, whatsoever of those of those um, um, digitalization initiatives are failing. The statement is not they fail. The statement is they don't um, uh, they don't achieve the expected, expected results. Right. Yeah. So and and disappointment always starts with the expectations. expectations. So manage the expectations <laughs> on this on the on the sponsor level on the C level straight away. And 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 explain um, why it's gonna yeah. why it needs to be addressed differently and why it takes longer. But this is this Absolutely. is crucial. This is important and, to really get into a transformation mode. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the challenge. Is we had a lot of really great successes during COVID, but the difference was like the CFOs, CEOs were present because they're like, I'm having to decommit to the street. I'm having I'm having to pull back guidance. Not because I don't know if the demand's there, but because I have no understanding if the supply uh, supply supportability or feasibility exists. Um, so a lot of those programs were successful. And there was an agreement that there was going to be stamina needed, right? They looked at it and they said, our house is on fire. We're going to invest in um, staff augmentation. We're going to invest in different strategies so my my current team can work on the business. I can pull some of my A players away to work, you know, to work, or excuse me, my current team works in the business. I can pull some A players away to work on the business and truly think about how we want to operate next 
And there was all this loss of revenue and revenue leakage that could be tied to the business case. So you can make longer investments. You could do some of these things around staff augmentation. You could take more time. Um, I think when we lost a little bit that over the last kind of 12 months, I'm starting to see everything's going back to, well, build me a case on just inventory rationalization. Memory. Yeah, like just build me a case on inventory mm -hmm. rationalization, right? Or build me a case on improved capacity utilization by 3 or 5%. Those business cases aren't things that the stamina at the executive level and the understanding at the board level and the appreciation to shareholder level um, persists in the duration that you need it to in order to be successful in some of these transformation journeys. So I think a lot of, again, a lot of it comes back to um, pre-setting the expectations, but also, you know, the companies that we see most successful, you know, come out and say, we're going to define a strategy. Like Qualcomm was a great example. They said, look, um, and we did a, there was a webinar we did with supply demand executive with Qualcomm and they came in and said, look, at the end of the day, we need to diversify out of mobile. That's a three to four year journey for our engineering team. But when that finally comes to fruition, we need to have the supply chain ecosystem in place to realize it. So it's fine to spend a bunch of money on that because that's not a $5 million bet. That's a 10, $15 billion bet of market diversification. Um, and until companies really look at supply chain as something that drives differentiation in their ability to execute to market and their customer experience with regards to brand royalty and market share increase and stop looking at it as a necessary evil to get what they engineer or what they market or what they brand to the consumers, that shift from value versus cost um, focus makes it very hard to have the stamina to push back and say, no, if I'm going to change 2,500 planners and the way they do their job day in, day out, that's not an 18 month project, right? Mm -hmm. Because it just simply isn't. And I, I think that's the challenge the industry has, has persistently faced. And then there's a bit of a race to the bottom, right? Every software company wants to make sure they're not excluded because their timeline's too long, right? There's a perception that long timeline means software is immature. You know, so something that used to be two years ago now, all of a sudden people are quoting 12 months. Well, what changed? Right? The level of integration required is still the same. The number of people you need to change is still the same. The executive alignment you need to get is the same. The data still the, hasn't been cleaned. Right? So you just yeah, have like, so nothing, lines so nothing, of that so data. Changed. <laughs> yeah, so nothing's changed. Nothing has really changed. You still need to drive alignment across brands or regions or business units. You still need to look at a new strategy with centralization and localization because you should be able to centralize more and more and more with the advances in compute technology. So if anything, it's gotten more complicated, but suddenly the timeline's half of what it was four years ago. Right? And I think, that, I think that becomes another big issue. Yes. Yeah. I, um, I, I want to highlight a couple of comments. Um, so Arthur said from the, from the tech company perspective, uh, um, a big part of this sustainable growth, when we were talking about that earlier, um, is about making sure the change has a long-term positive impact measurable and as we mentioned according to the business expectations toward the tool which I, I think we talked about is or touched on it and maybe it wasn't in this conversation maybe it's just me you know repeating everything the same time <laughs> but but you know those system integrators the technology vendors and uh, you know i always say the tool not meeting the business expectations is often mm -hmm. because as klaus you know said they're not modeling model operate operating modelists. They are system integrators, and the business doesn't get that a lot of times. They think I'm going to tell the system integrator what it is, and then just going to build it, and then it's just going to make sense. <laughs> um, because I've been working here for four years, and I get it. So you should also get it in the 13 weeks <laughs> that you're going to build it out for me. Um, so, and also, you know, I've had. I've I've had a situation and I shouldn't I shouldn't laugh at it, you know, but because it's it's you know it's genuine, just not really again understanding how the tools work. But we we were doing UAT and one of the um, testers said, Well, why didn't the tool tell me to do this? And I said, Well, you didn't tell the tool to do that. Like you have to <laughs> teach it. <laughs> like it, like we we don't just turn, like you don't just go live and these things work, you know, they're business. <laughs> There's business logic and workflows like all of that has to be built into it. And I don't think that the business always understands that because we talk so much as technologists about all of the benefits of technology. Mm -hmm. But that's also like, let's 
preface that and the disclaimer is in a perfect world where you have identified and documented your business process and all of your data makes sense and everything is integrated and this all your decision tree logics and all your workflows is perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, another comment here um, usually i face companies that missed to sell the project internally to all stakeholders and more importantly to their users and therefore end up with a very low adoption how can leaders address such a challenge? Yeah, yeah. so I would, I'll take a crack at both of them together. So I think on the sustainability question, first thing that I always talk to clients, and, and we probably do about 20 to 30 re-implementations a year, right? So companies call us up and say, hey, this didn't work. You know, the business now has control, not the IT team. We're now looking at business partners versus kind of traditional software SIs. How do you go fix this? Um, I would say it's twofold. Like, first of all, you can start off and just, this pertains to both questions. Um, what are your adoption metrics that you're systematizing and codifying in the software from the onset? So in the very beginning of the process, right, you're going to say, okay, here's my business process. Here's what I'm expecting. Here's the system expectations. There should also be an aspect of like, what's the levels of acceptability and the usual adoption expectations and metrics? And that should tie back to your ongoing continual training uh, and educational processes, right? So if you see that certain planners have a ton of manually generated planned orders, or you're having constant deviations with regards to forecast value add or, or uh, tracking signal bias, or consistent violations of inventory strategies and policies, or the gap between your net requirements and your planned production continues to grow, which would have to do with what's happening in the factory. Like all those metrics are very easy to see in a system. So those should become new ways of identifying operational adoption and then each one of them has to have a, a collective action, right? And um, that can be training, that can be uh, transition with regards to decision-making authority, which is always a, a painful subject. Um, but I think that that's a key thing. What some of our clients have done very well is they've identified those up front and the core team members, their bonuses are tied to those adoption metrics, right? So Boston Scientific was a great example. The demand planning leads, you know, his name was Josh, like his entire comp for two years was tied to the adoption. It wasn't did the tool go live, it was, was he strong enough at building and influencing consensus around the demand planning organizations globally to adopt a new target operating model process? Um, and then did they stick with it? So I think that's a key area is, you know, uh, establish the metrics, systematize the metrics so that it's continuously visible uh, to everybody, and then tie it back to course corrective training and then have a uh, plan B when the people just simply are not willing to make the change. Right. And be and honest and, with and, yourself and about it. And assigning an accountable owner. Yep. It's, yeah. it's not just like the, the collective we. We will get yeah. it done. And the collective we, it never gets yeah. actually done. Yeah. But yeah. if someone is the owner, you talked about decision-making authority. Are they a respected decision-maker? Do they have the power to, and, to drive these things? And the social capital, right? Are they respected amongst their peers to be able to help drive and influence that change? And I think that gets missed. So that would be my first area. And the second one, and Klaus, I'll kick it to you. Um, the second area is what is your ongoing sustainability organization look like? So whether you want to call it a center of excellence, whether you want to call it a team of SMEs, your business conditions will change. You'll go from heavily constrained environments to less constrained environments. And as such, that decision logic and that automated workflow, right, has changed. I mean, there's been clients where we started the project in the middle of COVID and we were allocating every single die off a of wafer. And by the time we were finished the project, we had excess capacity and we were pushing wafers to fill a fab. Those are completely different business models, completely different rule sets. The tools need to be able to adjust to the business. I think a lot of times when we come in and do assessments, the tools were overly configured for the time and conditions of today with time. no sustaining organization to be able to adopt it. Oh, excuse me, to yeah. a, adjust it. And without it the adjustments, it. you lose the adoption. So make sure that you have that capability in place, yeah. whether it's in-house or through a partner. But there should be people in that organization that we consider the change evangelists who every day are going to the users and saying, what do you not like about the tool? What would be the next great thing? Like if you don't have a backlog of 200 to 300 enhancements consistently across process and technology and analytics that you're consistently modeling and rolling out, 
you are going to eventually see that value creepage and that drop off where you get to the point of like, do I need to do a re-implementation or do I need to do another technology switch? That's generally in that three to five year range and then it gets stress tested in that five to seven year range. In my opinion, it's completely avoidable. Like most of the re-implementations we do are because of uh, failure to drive adoption, right? A lack of consistent ability to enhance and upgrade the platform as well as the process. Uh, and then just a general misunderstanding of how to use what was configured because the people who made those decisions today are no longer with the company. And I think mm -hmm. that's a realistic nature with the tightness of talent. That the people who are really good that you're putting on these transformation projects, they're going to get promoted within a year of the transformation project going live. Or they're going to leave because they're going to get paid a lot more money by the market. So do you have sustainability and continuity in the organizational structure? Because yeah. then you, you almost very... kind of end up back in that tribal knowledge where the per the person who led it, they also have tribal knowledge. You know, when we talk yeah. about tribal workflows and tribal knowledge, a lot of times we think about, you know, that one person who has this one, like something comes in and it didn't, it didn't go the way they wanted to, but they know that this material <laughs> behaves in this certain way. So it's like, that's that one little off, but we forget about the people who, were the system admins, they were the super users, they were the evangelists. And, you know, to your point, Michael, that skill set is highly valuable in the market. And I don't think a lot of companies plan for, we just lost our key resource yeah. that knew everything about the implementation, that knew everything about the tool. And that's a, yeah. a really big reason and a way that you end up in 2020 with SAP version 2006. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and like, yeah. oh, oh, SAP told us they're actually not going to support this anymore. And we yeah. have no But there's also, there's also another aspect that is important in what, what Michael said. It's if you approach digitalization, digital transformation as a project with a start and an end. And, and at the end, you think, I'm done. I'm I did it. Yay. Right. You will fall back quickly because the business is changing quickly. Um, the, the surrounding conditions, the environment is changing, and you need to keep it up to date. Otherwise, new tribal processes will 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 establish their own. Yeah. yeah, will emerge straight away. Yeah. yeah. And I, we have we are coming up um, not like at the end in two minutes, but at <laughs> close enough to the end to where. I have not done my audience justice and shared action items throughout, <laughs> you know, the show. Um, so, of course, in the spirit of action items, we are talking about a lot. We're throwing a lot out at you guys. Um, but I mean, the action item is really go buy the book. <laughs> go buy the book. <laughs> the first action item is read the book. The second <laughs> item is tell other people to read the book. <laughs> Share the book with your team, with your boss, with your friends, with everyone yeah. you know. Um, yeah. And the, the third action item is to um, go to, I think it, so I have it here, um, page 34. Um, but 34, 35, you guys have identified three types of tribal workflows. So camouflage tribal workflows, broken tribal workflows, and blind spot tribal workflows. And I spent a lot of time just going through this, um, uh, starring a lot of stuff, underlining a lot of stuff, which are, you know, all things that I already knew. But a lot of times we just read it. It's presented in a different way. And it makes sense in a way to communicate it to someone who doesn't know. Um, yeah. So conduct a tribal litmus test um, with your team. And then action item number four, once you read the book, once you watch this episode and share this episode, if you already have an implementation plan, go do it again. Just <laughs> assume that it does not include all the stuff that we just talked about um, or create it in mind with all of the things that we've discussed here. Um, so I guess... Uh, 
action item number five is to like bookmark this episode and also share that. <laughs> um, but it's probably just part one, right? Yes, part. <laughs> that's part one. Um, and then Nicole, I don't, I don't know if we found the link to Amazon to be able to, um, you know, if you, if we can throw it in the comments. Otherwise, Amazon, um, we we know. Is there an audiobook version? Not yet. Not okay. yet. Klaus, are you going to narrate yes. that? Do I, it's do half I cover. It's some, I don't promise anything. Oh, Michael Barry. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I put see, Michael <laughs> once into this drama. I can't promise this right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, another comment from Arthur. Great. Uh, we've had companies with heavy usage of our BPM solution, but very few champions driving the change. Um, so that just goes along, you know, uh, with what we were talking about. Um, so, so we have five minutes um, and we could keep going and going and going. So I know that if I say one last comment, Klaus, that will take up five minutes. <laughs> one last comment from Klaus, one last comment from Michael. And then I, I don't know, like maybe we start a tribal sabotages digital podcast. I mean, there's, there's enough, <laughs> yes, great. There's a, enough content, cool not to say we do it forever, but even if we just do it for two years, you know, <laughs> uh, once a week, once every other week, there's plenty out there. Um, and I imagine that we could continue because I haven't been in the industry mm -hmm. as long as you have Klaus, but things are going to continue to change. New technologies are going to continue. And as we mentioned, yeah. we have short memories. So, so it's a it's a it's a fantastic idea. Um, if you go for this uh, tribal uh, podcast, um, I promise uh, to make an audio version as a deal. Is, is that okay? <laughs> okay, that was uh, that's not where I was going with that. I wasn't I wasn't putting the onus on me. The collective we, so that it never gets done. <laughs> okay. So the greatest feedback that I got on the book so far was a CIO that came back and said, I read the book, um, I found it great, I gave it to my CEO, and a week after, I saw it on all of the C-level and senior leadership's desk, desks, um, because it, it, it apparently um, uh, was important enough to uh, to kind of be mind-changing um, for, the, for, for the leadership um, in order to go for real transformation. Um, um, that's, that's um, I think, something um, that is close to what we wanted to achieve with, with launching the book. And I'm, um, I'm really, um, uh, thank you for the, for, the, for the podcast, for the, for the opportunity to talk about that. And I can just, just encourage, um, you'll find me on LinkedIn, you'll find the book on Amazon. And I'm always approachable um, from, uh, from, from anyone and er anywhere. So um, if there's anyone out there who wants to have a chat, on specific topics more than happy to do so Just and we're not we're anything. not ashamed of saying also if you recognize that you need help klaus will charge you hours to help you <laughs> and provide value <laughs> like if, you know that let's let's it, it is what it is you're an expert you guys wrote the book if you need help you know you know a, a, again a lot of i have a lot of conversations it's so hard to find a digital supply chain expert. It's so hard to find someone who gets the business, who understands the technology, but also understands what a good implementation should look like and how yeah. to actually make that happen. So um, if you need help with that, we're all here to help. We're all in different, <laughs> we're all in different regions. Um, and I don't consider any of us competitors. You know, our focus is small and mid-market. You guys are on a whole different scale. Um, so anyone here on the screen um, can can help you with that. Uh, Michael, comment to wrap us up. Yeah, I, I would just say that in the book, we intentionally, well, Klaus intentionally titled it against my mother's objection um, to be thought provoking. <laughs> Um, and I think I think we are truly trying to challenge a paradigm of thought process. Uh, and in so you have to be bold. But I also want to leave people with the concept that like this shouldn't be scary. Um, doing it right isn't you know exponentially harder. It doesn't cost exponentially more money. Um, you have to be a little bit more thoughtful of the way you do it. You might have to invest some calories in convincing traditional ways of technology purchasing to be more considerate and thoughtful with regards to the business impact. Uh, but a lot of the the things that we recommend are just shifts 
in where you do the work and what comes first versus second. And at the end of the day, it materially increases your probability of success. So I don't want anyone to think that this is like such a big change in the way my company operates that it's so overwhelming and daunting, I can't do it. it. Yeah, it, it can be as simple as starting out with, hey, spend two to three weeks with somebody who really knows the tools and get an understanding of like, what's your North Star in like a quick strike? And it's like, I had a client today and said, do you guys ever want to go to network planning? And they said, we're nowhere close to that. But maybe in two to three years we do because we spoke to a bunch of leaders of the industry and CPG and they all do it. Okay, well, that's a great boundary condition. So throw out these five softwares you're looking at because none of them get you there. You have no chance, right? So a lot of this stuff can be handled in just a few conversations or a week or two investment up front. Um, and, you know, again, a lot of us will be happy to provide you some of that guidance and roadmap, even free of charge. Um, just so that we minimize, you know, some of the black eyes that are painted on the industry, particularly in the supply chain transformation space of failed deployments. So, you know, I, I challenge you as an opportunity to be bold and think differently and truly create a long term and sustainable value for your company. But it's not such an overwhelming overhaul of the current processes today. It's just a reprioritization of the effort and the calories. Absolutely. And and I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, mark your calendars. Next show is November 10th. Um, we're going to be joined uh, by Norfolk Southern um, to be talking about some of their data and analytics, digital supply chain um, efforts related to safety incidents and sustainability. So that will be next month's episode. And then we're actually wrapping up the year, Michael, with Deborah from Jim nice. Patrick, so to be talking awesome. about sustainability. So I'm super excited to have Deborah Dole on at the end of the year. We only have two episodes left for the year. And then we'll be getting into 2024, guys. Um, Q4 is here. The end is near. <laughs> 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 um, but that is the conclusion of today's show. Actually, before that, one thing that I did want to note, the thing that I really, really liked about this um, that Klaus and Michael did I think it was in like the first couple of pages. It says like skip to the end if you need the spoilers. <laughs> like if you actually like go do some stuff, like go to the last page. And I was like, oh, that was actually really great. And then you go back and read the, you know, read the whole yeah. thing. Um, it, so it aligns with our over our tagline, right? If you don't start at the end, you're gonna fail back at the beginning. Um, which I know a couple of people threw that quote out. So the whole concept is if you don't start at the end of where you want to be as an organization and what truly yeah. matters, which is your end customer's experience, you're going to fail recreating the steps that you do today to get there. So uh, we figured it'd be unfair to preach that as kind of a model and good. then not give it to you in the book. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Okay, we're over. Nicole's going to kill us. That concludes today's show. Thank you for listening and supporting. If today's content resonates with you and you're seeking hands-on support, for your supply chain to do any sort of implementations, visit newgenarchitects.com, schedule a free session with the member of the team. And if you want to be sure to never miss a show or catch the recordings, you can sign up at the NGA newsletter at newgenarchitects.com or also with Let's Talk Supply Chain. So everyone have a great weekend. Michael and Klaus, thank you for joining. Michael, thank I'm you, not taking any responsibility for you being on this call. It's been a <laughs> <laughs> I'll send her. I'll send her. I didn't need to do that. So <laughs> that's on you. You go handle that. Um, and everyone have a great weekend. All right. Take care. Thank you so much.